excuse the long delay between reading chapter four and chapter five. Uh, as some people know, I'm reading my grandfather, Wolfgang Friedman. He was murdered in 1972. Yeah, this is one of the books that got him in a lot of trouble. Yeah, he was a very outspoken academic, business researcher, lawyer, thinker, uh, humanist, and uh, had a platform at Columbia University to speak his mind. Yeah? Yeah. According to his best friend, this is one of the books that got him into trouble, right? Military and Strategic Uses of the Seabed from the Future of the Oceans, 1971. Wolfgang Friedman, it was dedicated to my grandmother, May. So let's get started. Military and Strategic Uses of the Seabed, Chapter 5. We have now seen how the steadily expanding claims of coastal states to ever-increasing portions of the ocean bed inevitably entail corresponding efforts to protect the physical and financial investments made by their nationals. It would be naive to think that the exclusive exploitation and other uses of certain portions of the seabed would not affect the rights to the surface, waters above them, and to any structures that reach from the surface down to the ocean floor. It would be even more naive to believe that the exclusive controls claimed by states, be it in the form of 200 mile territorial water zones, exclusive exploitation rights to the continental margin or exclusive environmental controls would not extend to military considerations. A state that claims sovereignty over the continental shelf or continental margin or erects structures on a sea bank is not likely to tolerate the military proximity of a potentially hostile state let alone the use of such structures by them. The seas have long been the theatre for naval battles as well as the peace, for peaceful commerce. Freedom of the seas has included the freedom of all nations to fight as well as to trade with each other. This has proved to be a great advantage to the major maritime powers in time of war, enabling them to protect their vital supply lines, to intercept supplies needed by their enemies and to exercise pressure on neural states by reducing their commerce with the enemy or cutting it off altogether. The naval superiority of Britain and the United States plays a vital role in the ultimate victory of the Allies over the relatively landlocked Germany and her continental allies in both world wars. Although future wars may see the decisive impact of naval power displaced by air forces and missiles, this might not apply to the limited warfare and characterises, for example, the present hostilities in the Middle East where the naval strength of the United States and the Soviet Union are vital factors in the balance of forces. Ooh. The growing accessibility of the ocean bed now adds a new dimension to the military power, balance of power and may prove even more decisive than the battle for air supremacy. There are two broadly different conceptions of the military use of the seabed. The first gives the ocean bed the same legal status as the superjacent waters, as in the case of internal waters and the territorial sea. This supplies the same freedom to the seabed and the subsoil as to navigation on the high seas. Since the high seas have always been used in times of war as in peace by the warships of all nations, and in recent years even for nuclear test explosions, notably by the United States and France, it would follow that countries are equally free to use the ocean bed for naval purposes. A second and opposite view reasons that since the ocean depths were until quite recently inaccessible to man, no usages or customs have developed with regards to the ocean bed, which must be considered a legal vacuum like outer space and for which laws have to be developed by practice and international treaties. This attitude was adopted by the Chilean delegate at the 23rd session of the United Nations General Assembly. He maintained that outside the limits of national jurisdiction, there were no rules of international law governing the uses of the seabed and the legal regime may remain to be developed by international legislation. In this confused legal situation, the United States and Soviet Union have led some intense manoeuvring. Oh, intense manoeuvring. Intense manoeuvring. So what do I think that means? Yeah, I think that uh, international law of the sea is really important for military and strate strategic uses. 
Okay, so in this confused legal situation, the United States and the Soviet Union have led some intense manoeuvring over the uses of the seabed for military purposes. Ever since the submarine became a, a major weapon in World War I and World War II, the uses of the oceans for military purposes under the surface and down to a very considerable depth has been taken for granted. The strategy of both superpowers is to a large extent based on nuclear propelled submarines equipped with long range missiles. The invisibility and mobility of such deadly arsenals now to be increasingly equipped with multi-head missiles makes them virtually invulnerable while they pose a lurking threat of near total destruction to the enemy. The tremendous increase of interest shown by United States authority in the military aspect of the ocean floor in recent years is indicated by the 1969 appropriation of 560 million for oceanographic programs as opposed to its allotment of only a few million dollars 10 years earlier. In the prolonged discussions of the 18 nation United Nations disarmament committee neither the united states nor the soviet union has proposed any limitation of the use of the seas for submarines as long as the united states had one-sided superiority in this weapon the soviet union may well have pressed such a proposal but in recent years the ussr has itself built up a formidable force of nuclear powered and missile equipped submarines which constitutes a potential menace to the united states in the atlantic the pacific and the mediterranean both states have, however, suggested certain limitations to the military uses of the, the seabed. The Soviet Union has presented a draft treaty that would prohibit the use of the seabed and the subsoil of the ocean floor for any military purposes. The prohibited area would encompass the seabed and subsoil beyond a 12-mile zone measured from the baselines used to define the limits of territorial waters. The United States has advocated a considerably more limited international agreement which would prohibit only the in place the emplacement of fix the reemplacement or fixing of nuclear weapons or other weapons of mass destruction on the seabed. The apparent reason for this is that the United States and its allies attach great importance to the installation of listening systems on the ocean bottom to be used for anti submarine warfare. The USSR seems to be less dependent on such systems. The two superpowers finally agreed on a joint minimum proposal that would prohibit the installation of nuclear and other mass destruction weapons on the ocean bed. This was approved by 24 members, all except Mexico, at the General Disarmament Talks on September 3, 1970. On November 17, 1970, the Political Committee of the United Nations approved the draft treaty by a vote of 91 to 2. However, the prohibition of fixed ocean bed installations would do little to diminish the danger of nuclear war and destruction from the sea, as long as mobile underwater warfare and weapons are allowed. But it is not only missile carrying and nuclear propelled submarines that constitute a deadly danger as the principal potential weapon of mass destruction in another world war. What is no less dangerous, just as it is highly promising for the development of peaceful commerce is the increasing accessibility of the ocean bed for transportation. Dr. John P. Craven, one of the world's leading authorities on the subject and until recently chief scientist in the Strategic System Project Office of the United States Navy, observes that the sea system, uh, open brackets, the use of the surface of the ocean, close brackets, has always been subject to a certain limitation, to certain limitations and handicaps in which he lists six. One, the perils posed by the changing conditions of the wind and the sea. Two, the impossibility to make landfall at an arbitrary portion of the coast for transfer of personal or cargo under moderate or modest sea conditions. The limitation of speed on the seas. The exposure to optical and electromagnetic spectra. Five, accommodation of large volumes and tonnages limited by draft and harbour conditions. Six, accessibility of seaborne vessels and installations to aircraft or airborne vehicles. Some of these factors pre present advantages as well as perils for activities such as the movement of large ships and cargoes across the seas. But in times of war, the perils outweigh the benefits. The ocean floor therefore presents certain unique and undeniable military advantages over the surface and superjacent waters. 
First, operations on the seabed would be independent of the conditions of the wind and the sea. Second, it would be possible under most conditions to transfer personal and, personnel and cargo anywhere along any coast. Third, any transit system on the ocean bed is essentially free of wave drag. Four, large volumes and tonnages could be... Large... Ooh. Large volume and tonnages could be accommodated, although in the respect there, in this respect there are structural limitations. Above all, ocean bed systems are practically inaccessible to optical and electromagnetic spectra as well as to the aircraft and virtually invulnerable to attack from the air. Another expert who favours the controversial anti-ballistic missile defence has suggested that listening posts on the ocean floor may not be as vital to the United States as they are now held to be. He foresees the rapid development of air cushioned surface ships with speeds ranging to 100 knots for medium sized ships of up to a, a few thousand tons by the end of the century. Since there is no prospect of a corresponding acceleration of submarine speeds, surface ships would be much safer in the future. Giant transport planes such as the trouble plagued C 5A, which recently made its debut in Vietnam, have become have begun to provide another alternative for the movement of troops across the oceans. Such giant aircraft could be in due course give decisive logistic support in major air wars even at remote distances and thus reduce the importance of submarine warfare. Such developments are predicted for the year 2000 but what of the critical 30 intervening years? Given the pre present combination of technological development and political tensions Three decades are a long time. For the moment, it seems almost certain that none of the major powers would, would forego the advantage of using the seabed beyond the banning of nuclear installations. Even if the United States and Soviet Union were to develop sufficient trust in each other's promises to mutually abandon the advantage of submarine and seabed mobility, China, with her growing technological and nuclear capability, remains tragically outside the main web of international relations and commitments. France has re refused to accede to the treaties banning surface nuclear tests and the proliferation of nuclear weapons, and most of the other middle-sized naval powers are no, are no more likely to forego immediately strate immediate strategic advantages for the sake of long-range objectives. The political factors that have paralysed any meaningful disarmament over the past few decades are just as likely to prevail in the new dimension of ocean bed warfare once again, the strategic need of mutually, mutually deterrent power will be used as justification for weapon, weapons build-up. In the meantime, it is likely that coastal states will gradually extend their control over the continental shelves to include any and every kind of seabed installation and operation. While the Continental Shelf Convention forbids any unjustifiable interference with navigation, fishing or the conservation of the living resources of the sea, it does permit the coastal state to construct and maintain or operate on the continental shelf installations and other devices necessary for its exploration and the exploitation of its natural resources. The coastal state is also permitted to establish safety zones up to a distance of 500 metres around its installation and take any measures necessary for their protection. No state powerful enough to protect its cost would permit another state to construct a potentially strategic transportation or other systems on the floor of its continental shelf. And it is, it is probably only the limitation of naval and, and air power that have so far prevented coastal states from proclaiming a ban on submarine movements within their continental shelves. In sum, the prospects for an effective international demilitarization of the ocean bed are only slightly less gloomy than those for the abolition of submarine warfare or indeed of any naval warfare. Disarmament is essentially a matter of faith and therefore a function of their, the political attitudes and relations between nations. A third world war has so far been avoided, not because of disarmament, but because of the present balance of fear, the certainty of the major military powers that another world war would lead to total destruction. And while there have been tough and militant leaders since Hitler, there has not been a madman at the helm of a major state willing to risk the total destruction of his own country for the sake of the pursuit of power. 
I'm just going to stop here. So, was my granddad's best friend, Philip C. Jessup, on the McCarthy list for his disarmament uh, activities? Yeah, so basically they used to persecute uh, academics who were anti-war and, and call them communists. Yeah, it was quite scary, the intellectual environment around the McCarthy time. Yeah. It also obligates the parties not to place in orbit around the Earth any objects carrying nuclear weapons or any other kind of weapons of mass destruction, install such weapons on celestial bodies or station such weapons in out of space in any other manner. It forbids the establishment of military bases and other military installations on celestial bodies, even if this treaty continues to be observed when the two leading space powers have put permanently manned space stations in orbit, the use of the ocean bed offers more immediate and familiar short-term military advantages. There is perhaps still a slim chance of preventing the use of the ocean bed for military purposes, so long as no country has actually begun to construct installations and otherwise include its use in the strategic planning. Its use use in its strategic planning. Once such steps have been taken, it will be infinitely more difficult to reverse direction. Scientific research, international cooperation and the control of the ocean bed, a new subheading. And how many more pages? Okay. There has never been a greater need for expanded and intensive scientific cooperation between nations on the many interrelated aspects of the ocean and their resources than now. In the field of non-living resources, there have, be, there have to be geological and geophysical surveys and the continental, of the continental margin, worldwide surveys of the topography of the sea floor, deep drilling at selected sites, both within and outside the continental margin, examination of the magnetism of sub-oceanic oceanic rocks, studies of the processes operating near the crests of mid-ocean ridges, studies in the relationship between land and sea structures in the trench arc system that surround the Pacific Ocean, and surveys of the distribution and composition of manganese nodules in deep sea areas. Woo! With regard to living resources, their concentration will have to be determined by systematic surveys in productive regions, with the help of acoustic and other techniques. A study of the entire ecosystem of fishing is needed as a basis for any rational regulation of the rate of fishing. There has already been much discussion of the intensification and rationalization of fishing through what some kind scientists call fishing ranches or aquaculture areas. All these surveys are closely connected with additional intensive, intensive study of ocean circulation and other still only partly explored aspects of the way in which water current, currents, winds, temperature changes, submarine rock layers and other aspects of oceanography affect the living resources of the sea. In an area of explosively expanding, expanding populations, this matter is of more vital importance to mankind than ever. But this, like so many other aspects of the freedom of the seas, is gravely threatened by the expanding claims of the different coastal states. The Geneva Convention on the Continental Shelf deals with this matter in Article 5.1.8. Article 5.1. The exploration of the continental shelf and the exploitation of its natural resources must not result in any unjustifiable interference with navigation, fishing, or the conservation of the living resources of the sea nor result in any interference with fundamental oceanographic or other scientific research carried out with the intention of open publication. 8. The consent of the coastal state shall be obtained in respect of any research concerning the continental shelf and undertaken there. Nevertheless, the coastal state shall not normally withhold its consent if the request is submitted by a qualified institution with a view to purely scientific research into the physical or biological characteristics of the continental shelf, subject to the proviso that the coastal state shall have the right, if it so desires, to participate or to be presented, re represented in the research, and that in any event the results shall be published. Both sections leave a good deal of discretion to the coastal state for the areas over which it claims exclusive or predominant jurisdiction, and it is, highly likely, it is highly unlikely that any state will give permission to carry out fisheries research to other states within their zone of exclusivity, whatever they might be.
Another problem is presented by the difficulty of distinguishing between purely scientific research into the physical or biological characteristics of the continental shelf and less purely scientific purposes, notably examination of the topography for military purposes. Unfortunately, as in the field of nuclear energy, the same kind of scientific research may have peaceful or military purposes and applications. Moreover, since the installation of various structures tends to give rise to claims of exclusive control and protection, the area open to free scientific research is likely to be further reduced. All this, of course, applies only to areas of national jurisdiction. But as we have noted throughout this study, the limits of national jurisdiction have been uncertain ever since the absolute depth, depth limit of 200 metres for the continental shelf was diluted by the vague test of exploitability and major coastal states proceeded to give exploratory and exploitation licenses well beyond that depth within the continental rise or the continental slope. As long as the limits of exclusive national jurisdiction remain as ill-defined as they are at, at present time, and as long as the decision whether to grant or withhold consent rests with the coastal states, we have to expect that in the prevailing climate of military confrontation and political distrust, national suspicions and rivalries will prevail over the need for international cooperation. Any attempt to restrict oceanographic or biological research in the area of the continental shelf is all the more deplorable since the bulk of exploitable fish and their breeding grounds are in that area. This state of affairs compounded with all that has been discussed earlier points up the urgency of redefining the areas of national control and creating some kind of international authority that would have jurisdiction over the economic, military and scientific uses of the ocean bed beyond the new limits of national sovereignty. Wow. So now I can add another topic to my granddad's interest, demilitarization. Yeah. So his best friend, Philip C. Jessup, was the king of demilitarization in the 40s, 50s, 60s and 70s. Yeah. Yeah.